Hey church, it is so good to see you today. Today is a special day. Across all of our campuses, we're having what we call a Young Communicators Sunday. These are the young guns, the young men and women that have a gift to preach and teach and lead and serve. And today, you're gonna to hear from some of the best and brightest HPC has to offer. These young men and women have a call of God on their life to preach and to lead, to serve. You know, they've prayed, they've studied. They're excited to be able to share with you this morning across all of our campuses. You know, as a church, we've always placed a high value on the next generation. And these are our sons and daughters who carry your heart, your spirit, your vision, and the DNA of this house. I believe they're gonna shape and influence the future of HPC forever. So what I want you to do, I want you to lean in, I want you to open up your hearts, put your hands together and help me welcome the young guns of HPC. Amen, amen. If you would, turn with me to Matthew chapter 14. And by I say, when I mean turn, what I mean is take out your phone and click to Matthew chapter 14. Um, all you people with paper Bibles, that's impressive. Matthew chapter 14, uh, give you some context to this passage. Jesus has just fed the 5,000. Most of us know that story. He takes five loaves and two fishes and blesses it and breaks it and passes it out. And scholars believe it wasn't just 5,000 people, but anywhere from 10 to 20,000 people, including women and children. So this has been an amazing miracle. God's done something incredible. And then we pick up in verse 22, and this is what the word of God says. It says, immediately after this, Jesus insisted, underline insisted, that his disciples get back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, he went up into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble, far away from land, for a strong wind had risen and they were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came uh, toward them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. But Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage, I am here. Then Peter called to him, Lord, if it's really you, tell me to come to you walking on the water. Yes, come, Jesus said. So Peter went over the side of the boat and walked on the water towards Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and waves, he was terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out and grabbed him. You have so little faith, Jesus said. Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshiped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. If you're taking notes, I want you to write this down. Write the phrase, faith over fear. Faith over fear. We're going to be talking about fear tonight. You know, a couple years ago before Amanda and I were dating, I was talking to this girl uh, in Tennessee. And I had some family that lived up in Tennessee, so I went to spend the weekend with them and hang out with this girl and just kind of see if there was something there. And so we get there, and she tells me that on Saturday she's got a surprise for me. She's going to take me someplace, but she won't tell me where she's going to take me, which should have been a red flag because I hate surprises. But I was like, cool, it's me and this other couple. We're going to go someplace. And so Saturday night comes. We drive for about 30 minutes, and we pull up. And I don't even know how, what the name of this would be, but we pull up to this open field, and they've put a bunch of scary, like, attractions up because it's October. It's close to Halloween. And so they have a bunch of different scary attractions. They have a haunted hayride, this haunted walk through the park, and then this barn of terror. And the only reason I'm there is because a few weeks earlier she had told me that she had gone and she had had fun and she asked, would that be something you'd be interested in ever going to, something like that. And I just wanted to sound manly and macho, so I was like, Shh, I'm not scared of nothing. It's like, yeah, I would, I would love to go there. That wouldn't scare me. This is why we don't lie. It, it always comes back to haunt you. And so we show up and my whole goal for the whole night is just not to embarrass myself. I just don't want to bring shame upon me and scream louder than I should in front of all these people that I really don't know. And so we start with this haunted hayride, and it's really not that scary. We, we kind of go. It's only a couple times that we jump, but nothing too bad. So I get off that. I'm like, okay, we're good. I'm good. Still got my man card. I'm good. So we move to the haunted walk through the woods, and this really isn't scary at all because it's open. It's well lit, and you can kind of see everything before you get there, so you have time to prepare yourself there's just this one guy, he jumped out from behind a tree and scared all of us. I will admit I did scream at that point, but everybody else screamed louder. 
So no one heard me. So again, I come out and I'm like, okay, I'm good. We're all good. Got my man card. And then we come to this barn. And I'm telling you, you could hear the screams of terror on the outside of it. And so we're standing in line, and you can just hear screams. And what it is is they've made this way through this barn. You have to zigzag all the way through, and it's pitch black. So you have to feel with your hands and try to navigate through this barn, and you can't see anything. And the whole time, things are jumping at you. They're grabbing you. They're screaming at you. And you can just hear how scared people are. And, of course, everybody looks at me and is like, hey, how about you lead? You go first. Like, I'd love to. God, get me out of here now. I'm just like, I'm in my mind thinking, if I call an Uber and just leave, you think they'll talk about me? Like, if I just walk away and never talk to them again, you think this will be a story they tell? And so I'm just, I'm just trying to gather the courage to go into this barn. And while I'm doing that, this other group comes up, and I'm just like, I try to play it off as nice, but I'm so scared that I, don't, I can't even move. And so I'm just like, hey, y'all, y'all go first. Y'all go first. And so they start going in, and what I realize is you have to go in single file. And so I just, have this, I just have this epiphany. So I turn to my group and say, okay, look, everybody grab my hand. We're going in. And this, this group, and God bless this man. I've never met this man before. I don't know who he is. But he's walking in. And so I just reach out and I grab his shirt and I close my eyes and I just walk in. I'm just like, I'm, I, I can't be scared of things popping out at me if I can't see them. So I just, I, I literally, I hold on to this guy's shirt I've never met before. And he just takes me through the whole thing. And so here's this zigzagging, and, you know, everybody thinks, like, I'm a hero because I'm going through this maze so fast. And I'm just like, I can't, I don't even know where we are. I'm just, I'm just like, just get me out of here. And so we get to the end. We can see the opening, see the light, and we just take off running. And we get to the end, and this guy, he doesn't turn around, doesn't say anything. I think he saw me in my group early and was just like, this guy needs my help. So I'm, I'm just going to help this man. Just, I'm not going to say anything. And so I got to keep my man card that night. But, man, I was scared. <sighs> And so I just decided that day I'll never go to another scary attraction place ever again. Just fear. Talking about fear. Man, fear comes in all kinds of shapes and sizes, right? It, it, fear is everywhere. And fear is not something we just kind of grow out of, right? When I was younger, I was scared to death of the dark. I had to sleep with a nightlight. I don't want to admit to you how long I had to sleep with a nightlight. But I had to sleep with a nightlight. But now... I'm older, I'm grown, I don't have to sleep with a nightlight. I actually like it really dark in the room. If there's any light, I can't sleep. But how many know there's still things that keep me up at night? I, I may have grown out of that fear, but fear just takes different forms. For some people, fear is a diagnosis and not knowing what the outcome of that diagnosis is going to be. For other people, fear is very real in their finances. They look at their finances and then they look at their bills and things just don't add up. For other people, fear is their marriage and if they're going to last are their kids going to walk away from God? Are they going to disappoint their family, their boss, their friends? Are they going to be alone? Will they ever find someone? Will they ever be enough? Will they ever make it? And, you know, fear comes in all shapes and sizes. I know for me sometimes I'll just be laying in bed and fear will just come on me. And I'll just start thinking, man, am I good? Do I have what it takes to walk in everything God has for me? I, I look at the people on our staff and all the amazing things God's doing through them, all the things they get to do, and I'm just like, man, do, do I have what it takes to walk in what God, or did I pick the wrong profession? When I said yes to God, did I make a mistake? I mean, fear will just come on us. It just comes on us. And we can't always get to choose the circumstances that fear that we find ourselves in. We can't always choose our circumstances. I think about the disciples. Disciples watch Jesus, and he feeds the 5,000. They're probably like, man, what's next? And Jesus is like, get in the boat, go over there. I'm going to pray. And they're like, no. And it says Jesus insisted that they go into this boat, and he knows the storm's coming. And so they go off, and they get caught in the storm. Now, I'm not saying that God ever puts fear in our lives. The Bible says that God does not give us a spirit of fear but a power, love, and a sound mind. God never puts fear on our lives, but we can get in circumstances, and the devil knows this is an opportunity for fear. If I can attack them with fear and paralyze them, they'll never walk in what God has for them. We can't always choose our circumstances, but what I have found in life is that we do have a choice when it comes to fear, and the choice is this. We can choose faith, or we can choose fear. We can choose to walk in fear, or we can walk in faith. We can choose to be overcome by fear, or we can choose to overcome by faith. There's always a choice, faith over fear. My hope is tonight that we would learn how to choose faith over fear and that we would live in faith. I think there's three moments in this story where the disciples had a choice. They had a choice of faith 
and a choice of fear. And I think we can learn from these choices. And if we learn to choose these things, I think we can be able to walk in victory over fear. And the first choice of faith is this. The first thing we have to choose is we have to choose to see. We have to choose to see. It says the disciples were out. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. If I'm ever up at 3 o'clock in the morning, I'm in a grumpy mood. And they're out at 3 o'clock in the morning. Jesus is gone. He's up praying. And a storm comes. And they're paddling and they're trying to figure out how to get through this storm. And they're doing everything they can to survive. Man, this is a violent storm. They have experienced fishermen in the boat that know that this may be a storm that ends it all for them. And so they're fighting for their lives. And then they look up and they see a figure. And it's Jesus. But they have no clue that it's Jesus. They think it's a ghost. You know, fear can blur your vision. Fear can distort your view of God. One of the reasons the devil wants to put fear in your life is because he wants you to have a bad view of God. He wants you to have a skewed view of God. He wants you to think that God's not even even there. He wants to put fear in your circumstances so that you can't see where God is. So we have to choose to see. And you know, the choice to see, I found, starts way before we ever get ourselves in a storm. The choice to find God and hear his voice always starts way before the storm comes up. Because if by the time the storm comes and then we get desperate for God, sometimes it's too late and we can't hear his voice anymore. If we wait till the storm pops up, then the waves can get too big and the wind can get too loud and we're not able to hear God anymore. We can't see him anymore. Our vision's blurred. But if we start beforehand, if we can figure out how to find God before the storm comes, then when it comes, we can see him clearly. You know, the disciples, they had spent time with Jesus, but when they looked up, they didn't understand it was him. We've got to spend time beforehand so we can know his voice and know his ways and we can recognize him where he's at. You know, storms, when they come, they make us desperate, right? They make us desperate for God. And that's why when storms come, we run to God out of desperation. But there's a verse in John chapter 15. It says this, yes, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Come on, how many heard this scripture? It's a great scripture. You will bear much fruit. But look at, look at the end of this. Apart from me, you can do nothing. See, the reality of this, it doesn't matter how peaceful your circumstances are. If you're not connected to God, you can't do anything. See, in my life, and I'm, I'm so, uh, I, do, I do this all the time. I'm so at fault here is that when things start to get calm, I start to think I can do it on my own. I start to try to put myself in control and say, okay, things are calm, I'm good, look at me, I can do this. And then all of a sudden a storm comes, I wonder why I can't hear God anymore. Because I kind of stepped back away and said, God, I don't need you as much right this second because everything's good, everything's calm, I can walk on my own. But what we need is a revelation of desperation. We've got to be desperate for God even in the calm seasons so we can see God in the stormy seasons. When we seek him in the calm season, we can see him in the storm season. But if we don't seek him in the calm season, we'll be blurred in the storm season. We got when it's calm, man, that's the time to get in your word. That's the time to grab a hold of God's word and dive in and get everything you can from it. That's the time where you got to dive into what Pastor Mike has preached on Sundays. Man, find good worship music, pray, spend time with God, hear his voice, learn how to recognize where he is so when things get crazy, you can recognize him easier. I don't know if you've ever been in a crowded room or the mall or somewhere that's just super loud. You've got a million conversations going on everywhere. And your brain does this cool thing that if you're walking through a crowd and all these conversations are happening, your brain just tunes them out. They're like, this isn't important to me. I don't need to know this. So you can just walk on and you can hear the noise, but you can't hear what they're saying. But if someone mentions your name, right, at the moment your name say, like, what, what was that? Are you talking about me? What, what's going on? Who said my name? Why? Because your brain knows that's important. Over the years, you've come to recognize your name, and it becomes so easily recognizable that even in public, even when you're around strangers, if someone says your name, you're on instant alert. Okay. I, I, know, I know that voice. I know that name. That has to be the same way with God. We need to be so familiar with the presence of God, so in tune with his voice, so in tune with his presence that when it gets crazy and chaotic and there's winds and there's waves, we can easily locate him because know, we know what his voice sounds like. He tells the disciples, he says, I'm the good shepherd. You are the sheep. The sheep know my voice and respond. 
We gotta know the voice of God. When we hear the voice of God and recognize it, then we can act. But when storms come and we're not able to hear it, then we're just stuck. We're stuck. If we can't see where God is, we become stuck. But if we'll take a moment beforehand and say, I'm gonna choose to see even in the calm. I'm gonna choose to seek even in the calm. Then when the storm comes, we'll be able to locate where we are. First thing we gotta choose, we gotta choose to see. Number two, if you're taking notes, number two, the second choice of faith that we have, the second thing we gotta choose, we gotta choose to step out. Gotta choose to step out. You know, Jesus says, hey, it's me. Hey, guys, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not a ghost, it's me. And Peter, I just, I love Peter. He goes like, if it's really you. You ever done that with someone? Like someone calls you and you think it's a prank call? Like, okay, if it's you, you know, tell me something. He goes, if it's you, but then he says something that just doesn't make any sense. He goes, if it's you, tell me to step out of the boat and come to where you are. Like of all the things you could ask for Jesus to recognize himself, like, hey, Jesus, if it's you, how about you just calm everything? How about you just calm now? Hey, Jesus, if it's you, how about you just like fly over here? <laughs> Jesus, if it's you, tell me my birthday and my favorite color and my darkest sin so I know it's you. Like just, if there's better questions to ask than, hey, how about I jump in the water? That thing's gonna kill me. So why, why, does, he, why does he do that? Why, why does he ask that question? I think there's two reasons why. I think the first reason is he realized he couldn't fix the problem on his own strength and he had to get where Jesus was. See, Peter's an experienced fisherman. Peter knows how to handle storms. Peter knows how to sail in a boat, but he knows there's something different about this storm and he's not fixing this. And so he says, the only way this gets fixed is if I get where Jesus is. He can fix this, I can't fix this. Church, can I tell you, there is such freedom and peace when you have an understanding that you can't fix it, but God can, and you just surrender into his hands. When you just take a step back and you go, okay, I can't do this, but God, I know you can, so I give this to you. And I don't know if you're like me, but I like to try to fix things on my own. You know, I, I like to try to take things and I fix them because at least then if I fail, it's my fault, right? At least I'm in charge. And so I was thinking our, our Healing Place college students, uh, they get assigned areas in ministry where they get to go and serve and learn and grow and so one of the ministries that someone picked was outreach. And so they were able to uh, work with me over uh, this past year. And we just were able to do amazing things. And I gave him a lot of responsibility. Very capable man. Uh, so I gave him a lot to do. He's, he's, he's amazing. But how many know there's some things that, like, are super important that I'm just not going to give him? Like, there's, there's some things that, like, I have to report to certain people, too, that I'm like... I'm going to do this one on my own to make sure it's done right. And it's not that I don't trust him to do it. I just want to make sure if it fails, it's my fault. If I'm not careful, I do the same thing with God. God, you can have all these things that, like, I'm sure you can work out, but this one, this really important thing, I, I'm, I think I'm going to hold on to this one, and I'm going to try to fix it on my own. But, man, there's peace and surrender. And fear makes you want to say, I, I'll fix this. God, I tell you, you're not muscling through your fear. You're not going to muscle through your storm. You're not going to out-paddle the waves You've got to say, God, i got to give it to you. And in surrender, Pastor Mike always says this, I love this. He says, God is completely responsible for a life that is completely surrendered to him. What's that mean? When I surrender my life, when I surrender my storm, when I surrender my fear, God's responsible for it. Because he's faithful and he's just and he'll take care of it. But when I hold on to it, I'm responsible for it. And I'm not very good at these things. But if you surrender to God and place it in his hands, then he's in control. I think the first reason he got out is he knew he couldn't do it on his own. The second thing I think he needed to do, the reason why he stepped out of the boat, he chose to step out, was this, is that he knew that he had to leave some comfort behind to walk in everything God had. He had to leave some familiar behind and step out into something new to walk in everything God has. You know, fear, at the end of the day, fear is the thought that you may lose something. Right, that's what fear is. You, we get scared and we have fear because we think we are going to lose something. And what happens when you think you're going to lose something? You start holding on to things. You start grasping things. You start clinging to things. This is why you see people when they walk through storms, they start reverting to old habits. They go back to old addictions. They go back to old friends, old circumstances, old ways. Why? Because it's familiar. Because it, it makes them feel comfortable because when everything else is out of their control, they try to control something. They try to hold on and say, I'm going to stay in what's familiar, and I'm going to cling to what's familiar because that makes me feel secure. 
Because they don't, what we don't understand, it's, it's way more secure in the wind and the wave with Jesus than it is on our own in the boat. We'll still sink in the boat. The boat was going under. It was just a matter of time. It maybe had a little bit more life than just jumping in the water, but it was going under. There's no security in holding on to things and thinking that that's going to be your salvation. Your salvation is Jesus. we got to step out the boat. We gotta let some things go. We gotta let some friends go. We gotta let some people go. We gotta let some habits go and walk into what God has for us. We gotta step out in faith. Maybe that's getting a small group. Maybe that's going to next steps. Maybe that's getting an accountability partner. But there's some things you gotta let go and gotta, things you gotta step into. We gotta step out. We gotta choose to step out. We gotta choose to see. We gotta choose to step out. The third thing and the final thing is we gotta choose to step again. We got to choose to step again. You know, Peter, he gets out the boat and he starts walking. The Bible says that he walks towards Jesus. He walks on water. I don't know how far he got. I don't know how close to Jesus he got. I assume he got somewhat close because the next verse says that when he started to sink, Jesus immediately reached down and grabbed him. So I assume there's some sort of close proximity. But at some point, Peter's walking and he realizes that the wind hasn't stopped and the waves haven't stopped. I don't know this. It doesn't say in the Bible. This is just my thought. But I bet Peter thought when he stepped out of that boat that everything was going to be okay. That he stepped that boat that it was immediately going to calm and he was just going to be able to walk to Jesus. And he had seen Jesus calm a storm before. So I'm going to step out. It's going to be awesome. And then everything's going to calm and then nothing, nothing changed. Actually, the storm stays the same. So what happens when we choose to see and we choose to step out and then our circumstances don't change? Our storm's still going. It's still raging. We've done all the right things. We've got the, as close to Jesus as we could. Man, we let go of some things. We surrendered it to God, and we took a step of faith in the water, and then the storm is still there. See, at this moment, this is critical because what the devil wants you to start doing is he wants you to start focusing on your circumstances. Jesus wants you to focus on him, but the devil, he wants to shift your eyes to the circumstances. And this is what happened to Peter. Peter's walking on water. Everything's good. Then all of a sudden, he realized the only thing between him and sinking and death is his faith. And he realized there's no boat. His sandals aren't going to make him float. It's just him and the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. And he has a revelation of, this is not good. And so he starts focusing on his circumstances and how great his circumstances are. And he has a revelation of, man, I, this is, I can't fix this. This is bad. And he's so focused on how bad his problem is that he misses out on what Jesus is doing and he starts to sink. See, the devil wants you to focus on your circumstances. God wants you to focus on him. You know, Hebrews chapter 12, it says this, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. I love the language here, just fixing your gaze, fixing your eyes locking in on Jesus, locking into what he's doing, locking into him, and not on your circumstances. Because when you start looking at your circumstances, you start attributing the attributes of God to your circumstances. See, when you focus on Jesus, you say, okay, he's so big, he's so mighty, he's so powerful, he's so great. But when you focus on your circumstances, you start going, they're so big, they're so mighty, they're so powerful, so they're so great. But when we fix our eyes on Jesus, we realize who he is and our circumstances aren't that big at all. I think about the story of David and Goliath, a whole army sitting out there. This one giant comes out and is taunting them. This is a people that have seen God part the Red Sea, seen God part the Jordan River, seen the walls of Jericho fall. They've seen so much, and they're standing, and one man, and they're terrified. Why? Because he was bigger, he was stronger, he was a better warrior. They knew there was no one that could defeat him in their army. They knew it. They, I can't do it. You can't do it. He's bigger and badder than all of us. See, they looked at their problem, how big there was. And then here comes David, little shepherd boy David. And he walks up and he looks at God and says, y'all scared of Goliath? Y'all scared of this guy? Oh, he's bigger than us. He's small to God. Hey, he's bigger than me. Cool. He's not bigger than God. You're going to let him taunt God? See, when we focus on God, we start to realize, yeah, our storms may be bigger than me, but they're never bigger than God. The waves may be bigger than me, but they're never bigger than God. I may not can control this, but God can. I may not be able to keep going, but God can help me. The waves are not bigger than God. They're bigger than you. And I feel like that's a good place for us to be in. When we start to realize, these waves are bigger than me. 
I can't do anything. But oh, if you see God, fix my eyes on Jesus. And here, here's the thing too. Peter forgot he was walking on water. Fear will make you forget what God's already done in your life. Peter's walking and he's not sinking. No one else has walked on water besides Jesus. He's walking on water and he is not sinking. I don't know if you've ever tried to walk on water, but you sink. He's walking on water. He is walking on water. And in a moment, he forgets it. In a moment, he looks at his circumstances and says, I'm going to drown. He forgot that he is walking on water. What are the miracles in your life you've forgotten because of fear? What are the things God has done in your life that in a moment you've forgotten because your circumstances got so bad? If he's fixed it once, he can fix it again. If he did it once, he can do it again. When we fix our eyes on Jesus, we remember what he's already done for us. Let's just take this. He died on the cross for us. If we just remember that, then what else can he do? Let's remember that miracle, not to mention everything else he's done in our lives. See, we're so quick to forget what he's done and even the little things. That's why we got to have gratitude and thankfulness. Every day it's good to just wake up or before you go to sleep, just thank God for what he's doing. Write it down so you remember. So when things get hard, you can go back to what he's already done and say, okay, it may be hard now, but it, it was hard then and he came through. It may be different now, but it was, it was the same then and he made it through. I maybe can't do it now, but he did it again. We can make it through. We just got to keep stepping. When we stop stepping, we start sinking. Because fear wants to make us stop. And when we stop, we start to notice what's around us. But if we fix our eyes, we just keep one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time, one step at a time. Focus on Jesus. But the moment we stop is the moment we look around and we notice too much. We, we start giving our circumstances too much power. You know, my wife, she, she loves missions. She loves missions. She's been all over the world doing missionary work, bringing the gospel Traveled way more than me. Her passport's so much bigger than mine. There's just been a few places. She's been everywhere. And it's just funny because when you travel with her, you're just like, I thought I knew what to do in airports. Like, I thought I knew how to travel, but I, I don't. She, but she does. It's like you start packing, and she taught me what packing cubes were. I didn't even know those existed. Packing cubes, who knew? And so she's traveled all over the world. But her last mission trip, it was a nine-month trip. She was leading a group of girls to three different countries. And while she was Africa, she got malaria. And so she gets sick, and she actually ends up flying to Guatemala with malaria. She didn't know, and she's sick in Guatemala, and finally she gets treated. And so there's a couple different strands of malaria. I, didn't know, I don't know if you knew this. I didn't know this. Some are better than others if you get them, and they, ca they catch it pretty fast, and then they just treat it. But hers is pretty rare, and it's the one that really it will kill you pretty fast. And it's so rare that the hospital she was at didn't even test her for that strand because it's, it's just rare, especially rare in Guatemala but she got it in Africa. And so she gets super sick, and she, you, you know, it, it's, it's, it's crazy, it's bad, but her dad's there, and, and God just does a miracle. God heals her, and God pulls her through, and so she comes back home, but it was so intense on her body, she came back home super weak. She had, had a ton of blood transfusions, just, she was so anemic, and so I remember when she got back, this is April, so I remember when she got back, and I walk up and it's like, man, this is, this is hard. She can't even walk five steps. She starts to walk and she needs help being, you know, walking. You got to like help her down the steps. It's just like, you can tell she's just been through a lot. And so just five steps and like, man, it looks like she's going to pass out. And then I would go over and she'd get a little bit stronger, walk a little bit further. Now the trip to the car is not so bad anymore and she just gets a little stronger. And then, of course, you know, we're in, we're in love, so we start going on walks because that's what you do when you're in love. You just go on walks together. So we'd go on walks, and, like, we would walk a little bit, and she would say, okay, it's, it's, it's starting to feel bad. We, need, we probably need to head back so we get back before I'm too tired. I'm like, okay, that's cool. And then the next time we'd walk a little further, and then we'd walk a little further, walk a little further. And then fast forward to November of that year. So that was April of this, that year. Fast forward to November, Thanksgiving morning, we decide to run a race, and you may have heard it's called the Turkey Trot. Any Turkey Trot alums in here? Anybody run the Turkey Trot? I see you. That's awesome. It's the best thing you can do before Thanksgiving because you feel no guilt for whatever you eat. You say, I just ran three miles. I can eat whatever I want. Give me that second piece of pie. I don't care. So November, April to November. Watch this. April to November, 
she runs a 5K. Could barely walk five steps, 5,000 meters. Could barely walk five steps, 3.1 miles. Look, I know stepping again may be hard. It may take everything in you to take that next step. It may be the hardest thing. You say, Tanner, I'm going to pass out. This is, it takes everything in me. Just keep stepping. Tanner, this, this, this step, I don't know. Just keep stepping. Tan okay, this step, just keep stepping. And what you'll find is the more you step, the easier it gets. The more you step, the next step's like, okay, hey, okay, I got my sea legs. Okay, this isn't so bad. Okay, I can step one more time. And the next thing you know, you'll be running. You will be running on water. And this is what happens when you start running on water in the midst of fear. People start noticing. People start looking at you and go, wait, 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 wait. With your circumstances, how do you have joy? I'm just stepping. How do you have peace with all this going around? I know that diagnosis. How do you have peace? Oh, I just fixed my eyes. I'm just stepping. How did you get there? Hey, it was hard the first time, but hey, I've done this a while. I know how to fix my eyes on Jesus. I'm just stepping. You'll start running on water. People will start noticing how you're running, and they'll be amazed at what God's doing in your life. You'll just say, Hey, you, you can do it too. Just focus on Jesus. We choose to see. We choose to step out. We choose to step again. And I, I don't want us to miss the main part of this story. This story is about, it's about fear, yes. It's about Peter walking on water, yes. It's about them worshiping at the end, yes. But here's the main point of the story. Here's what we can't miss. is at the end of the day, the disciples were in trouble. And Jesus came down and rescued them. He was on a hill praying, and they say you could see the whole lake. He saw them, and in their most desperate hour, he came down, and he rescued them, and he calmed the storm. And this is just a small picture, such a small picture of what the gospel is. Because in our desperate hour, in our sin and in our shame, Jesus came down from heaven, and he rescued us. See, Jesus wasn't intimidated by their fear. He definitely wasn't intimidated by their circumstances. He wasn't even intimidated by Peter's doubt, but he came down and rescued us. He wasn't intimidated by our sin. He wasn't intimidated by our shame, but he came down and he rescued us. And if he saved us from sin and death, if he would come from perfect heaven and come down into our filth and our mess and rescue us then, why couldn't he rescue us now? If he did it then, he can do it again.